All right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's a pleasure to welcome our speaker today, it's, uh, Nicholas Miller from uh, Purdue University, and he's going to tell us something about arithmetic progressions in uh, primitive line spectra. Hi. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about arithmetic progressions in the primitive length spectrum and sort of the beginning of the talk, I'm going to try to give some background on what the two things we're going to be looking at are and then maybe tell you a little elongated story about why anyone would care about arithmetic progressions in the primitive length spectrum. Uh, and then towards the end I'll try to get more towards results. So uh, for today, when I say a manifold, I'm going to mean a hyperbolic manifold in two or three dimensions. So today, uh, by a manifold M, manifold M, I'm going to mean uh, M is going to be some quotient of hyperbolic space, N space, uh, by a lattice. And here N is always going to be, in, is going to be two or three. OK, and gamma is always going to be a lattice. So gamma is a lattice in G and G, which is going to be either uh, PSL2R or PSL2C. So by lattice, of course, I mean uh, I'm going to have them be torsion-free uh, discrete subgroups of PSL2R, PSL2C, and they're going to have finite co-volume. So this will be a, a finite, my manifolds will all be finite volume as well. OK, so there's sort of two key players in the talk today. The first is going to be arithmetic manifolds, which are going to be a special class of these hyperbolic manifolds. Uh, and, uh, well, arithmetic hyperbolic manifolds, and uh, then also the length spectrum will come into play. So first, uh, we'll talk about arithmetic hyperbolic manifolds. Okay, so to get to that, I'm going to briefly recall the definition of commensurability for you. So recall that we say two, recall that uh, M1, and M2 are commensurable. It's a squeaky chalk. Uh, if there exists some other M such that we have the following diagram. So M is going to finitely cover M1 and M2. So this is going to be finite cover, and this is also going to be a finite sheet cover. So if M1 and M2 share a finite sheet cover, we'll have them be commensurable. Now, if you sort of remember what mostow prasad rigidity tells you, it tells you that if you're in a situation where you have sort of isomorphic discrete groups uh, in the isometry group and n is bigger than 2, then they're conjugate inside the isometry group. So this sort of result uh, leads one to the definition of also the commensurator. So we also define the commensurator, the commensurator. by, so it's going to be some funky notation here, and it's going to be all the elements of G. So remember, G is our isometry group here, and it's such that when I take the intersection of the original lattice with the twist of the lattice, then I get that this is finite index in both. So these are exactly the elements that give me something that's going to look like we're in this situation. And usually we're interested in studying manifolds up to commensurability because these sort of share lots of properties. So this takes us to the commensurator. And this, this also leads to the definition of an arithmetic lattice. So uh, this is a definition. So this is maybe the first main player of our talk. And it's a definition slash theorem, actually. So an arithmetic lattice. Arithmetic lattice uh, is one such that is a lattice is a lattice such that this commensurator is dense. So commensurator is dense is dense in G. Okay, so a couple things. First, when I say density, I better tell you what I mean by dense. So here I mean dense in the, the strong topology on G. Because if we go to the Zariski topology, a lattice is already dense. Uh, and the second thing is, why is this a definition slash theorem? Well, actually, I've sort of given you an equivalent characterization of what a lattice is, because it's easier to state this way than the real definition. Uh, and maybe I should at least give credit where credit is due. This is the equivalent uh, characterization by Margulis that says that uh, an arithmetic lattice uh, is dense 
or a, a lattice is arithmetic if and only if it's dense and it's commensary. Okay. No class. Yeah. Or sorry, commensary is dense in G. That's what I meant. Sorry. Right. So, so some people call this the Margulis dichotomy. I think that. Okay. So uh, if you didn't like any of that, if arithmetic lattices aren't your thing, then there's two sort of main examples, which are sort of the best things to keep in mind. So PSL2Z inside of PSL2R. So this is lambda, or sorry, this is gamma. And then G is PSL2R. Okay, so this is more frequently known as, it's gonna be the modular curve. Okay, and the second example is something like, say, gamma, which is PSL2 Z a joint I, and G is PSL2 Z. Or generally, if rings of integers are your kind of thing, you could take PSL n ring of integers and put it inside of, of the appropriate G. Um, so, so why does one sort of care about uh, arithmetic manifolds? Well, this commensurator being dense sort of tells you that these, these arithmetic manifolds you get from these arithmetic lattices with this quotient construction, they're particularly symmetric. In fact, they have a lot of sort of hidden symmetries, which are symmetries that are visible in finite sheet covers where you might not have found them otherwise. And there's a lot of them. And so, in particular, you know, if you think about what the modular curve looks like, this has a ton of symmetries. And this is sort of the generalization of what the Z points inside of, of that should look like. Okay. So this is sort of the first key player. These arithmetic manifolds, these highly symmetric things, are things we want to think about. Okay, th the second uh, player in this talk is going to be the primitive length spectrum, or the length spectrum in general. Okay, so before we get there, let's just sort of briefly recall some facts about geodesics. And the nice part about hyperbolic geometry is sort of these facts is that we have that the set of closed geodesics on my manifold M on M, which is HN mod gamma, at least in the two and the three setting, these are going to be in one to one. Oh, there's a desk there. These are going to be in one to one correspondence with uh, uh, elements gamma in gamma such that the trace of gamma is bigger than two. So here by brackets, I mean I'm taking the conjugacy class uh, inside there. And these will give me all the closed geodesics on, on my surface. So how does such a correspondence arise? Well, if you think about, at least in the n equals 2 case, so if you think about h2, if you take any, any element with trace bigger than or equal to 2 in gamma, then it's going to have two fixed points on, right on the edge. And so what you'll get is you'll get a big circle like that. And if I conjugate this element around, it's actually not going to change this invariant circle that's between these two fixed points. And that'll give me a geodesic on H2. And then if I want that geodesic to descend to the manifold, well, it turns out if you look at, say, say in the SL2Z case, if you look at the fundamental domain, then these two points are going to glue up. So you'll get a closed geodesic on the surface once I identify these two. OK, so this is sort of a, a general phenomenon about these, which is really nice. We can start to study the group instead of think about the geodesics. So we also have a relationship. So there's also a relationship. It is a relationship. between the length of gamma, between the length of gamma, length of gamma, uh, or sorry, the <laughs> length of the geodesic. So, so maybe I should call this, so we'll say this is gamma goes to C gamma, okay, the length of C gamma, and, and the element itself. And this is given by the length. Well, sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, or, or the eigenvalues in general, it's okay. So th this is the length of the, the length of C gamma is two times the log of say, well in this case you could say just the biggest eigenvalue. So here this is the biggest eigenvalue of gamma. Value of gamma. But if you want to put co cosine, hyperbolic cosines in there then you'll get the trace out too. Okay. Okay, so uh, through this sort of definition, we can also see that if you took a power, an appropriate power of gamma, 
and it's going to multiply the length by the same number that would come out front, just via the sort of standard log rules. Okay, so we don't just want to study sort of general geodesics. We actually want to study uh, primitive geodesics instead, for at least for today's talk. So also just recall that a primitive geodesic, so a primitive geodesic is one that traces out its image only once. So there's one that traces its image only once. Only once. So what I mean by that is if you have some sort of general surface like this, you have some geodesic like that, I only want to wind around this circle once as opposed to just going around a bunch of times. We would call that geodesic not primitive. So if you look at this group theoretic to close geodesic uh, dictionary, then on the right side, a primitive geodesic would correspond to a primitive conjuge conjugacy class, meaning there's an element inside of it such that only, or such that it's not a proper power of some other element. Okay, so these are the geodesics we want to study. Okay, so let me take you on, or so for these, we can define the length set. So okay, the second sort of key player in today's talk, we have the arithmetic manifolds. We're, these are going to be our super symmetric uh, manifolds. And the other thing that we're going to consider today is the length set. So definition, uh, the length set is the collection of lengths, probably as you could guess, lengths of all all closed geodesics, closed geodesics on M. And we're going to denote this, so, so we'll denote this by uh, L of M. Okay, and this is without multiplicity. So this is without multiplicity. Okay, if you include, if you include the multiplicities into this thing, then you get what's called the length spectrum. So so the length spectrum includes multiplicities. Spectrum includes multiplicities. So so these, and we'll denote this as script L G, or sorry, script L of M. And similarly, you could form the same sets with the primitive geodesics. If I want to throw away all the all the all the non-primitive geodesics then I'll just put a little p, and I'll, I'll remark that again when I do that. OK, so as sort of a, a, a brief detour, uh, just very brief, this has sort of a, this, this collection of, of lengths of closed geodesics has sort of a long history uh, in its study. So um, a question that's been sort of often studied in this stuff, so a question is given two manifolds, say M1 and M2, such that their length sets are the same. Uh, one could ask if they're commensurable. So are they commensurable? So this is a question that's been studied for a lot of years, and it relates fairly heavily to the, the can you hear the shape of a drum type of questions. So all these questions have a spectral side. Uh, using the Laplacian on, on these manifolds, and that's sort of via the trace formula. I don't want to get too much into that, but the sort of spectral side is, I think, maybe where this question originated. And then uh, you convert that to the length spectrum, and you ask, uh, up to finite sheeted covers are all manifolds that have the length, same length spectrum the same? And so uh, what, what can you say about this question? Well, in general, not too much. Okay, so this question is actually fairly, I think, difficult in general. But if you assume arithmeticity, so if m i are arithmetic, then there's actually a few results in this in this direction, and there uh, some are some are relatively recent. So uh, Reed in the '90s, so Alan Reed in the '90s uh, said that the answer to this is yes for n equals two. Okay, and then uh, Reed with other people, so I, this is Chinberg, Chinberg, Hamilton, 
long and read. And I always forget the year on this. Um, this is yes for n equals 3. And then sort of recently in this gigantic work by uh, Prasad and Rappenchuk, Prasad and Rappenchuk, They, they sort of classified all of the symmet locally symmetric spaces where the answer is yes and told you exactly when the answer is no. But let me just say that there's a counterexample, counterexample when n is 5. And actually, there's, there's counterexamples for every n that's congruent to 1 mod 4. Um, but that sort of gets into some theory of division algebra and hardcore number theoretic tools to attack such a problem. So this is sort of the history of the length spectrum. Uh, it's, it, it was. Uh, it's been studied to figure out, you know, can we tell up to finite sheet covers that these things are the same um, in general? Okay. Oh, I lost my page. Okay. So these are sort of the, going to be the, the two main key players uh, for today's talk. Okay, so now that we have these, uh, the sort of next part is the story time. So why, why do these two things, or well, how, how does this mix with the story that I want to tell about arithmetic progressions? So it turns out there's an analogy between uh, uh, primes and the integers, and the integers, integers and primitive geodesics. So let me say this is sort of a very striking thing, at least when I, when I first learn it. And uh, in general, I think it's, it's a non-existent dic dictionary, but a fairly good uh, heuristic. So there's been a lot of sort of classical theorems about primes and the integers that, we've been able to that have been able to be translated to theorems about primitive geodesics. Uh, and maybe the first and most surprising uh, such is the prime number theorem. So the classic, remember the classic prime number theorem. theorem is the prime number theorem. So the classic prime number theorem says that uh, if, say, pi of x uh, is the function that spits out the number of primes less than x, right? So it's the function, um, so if pi of x is just the cardinality of the set of primes, so p such that p is prime and uh, p is less than or equal to x. So you just spit, what? Oh, x, yeah, sorry. Be a pretty easy function otherwise. Okay, then asymptotically, asymptotically, you know that this function behaves like x log x. So this is the prime number theorem. It's been around forever. I think we all learned it a fairly long time ago. And it turns out that actually you have a similar growth rate of, of uh, primitive geodesics of length less than L. So this is what's probably commonly referred to as uh, the prime geodesic theorem. In fact, I think that's the title of Sarnak's thesis. So theorem, this is the prime geodesic theorem. Desic theorem. Okay, and this says that, uh, did I call this function something else? Probably not. Okay, so given hyperbolic M, and I should probably say compact hyperbolic M, uh, let pi L be the function that does the same thing but for geodesics. So the function that gives the cardinality of uh, the number of geodesics. So let's say C gamma, such that C gamma is a geodesic, geodesic, and the length, length of C gamma is less than or equal to L. Uh, well, I'll get there but not yet, uh, then 
then the asymptotic growth of this thing is like e to the l over l. OK, so you look at this, you look at the prime number theorem, you might say, OK, they're slightly off. But if you quickly change variables to make l log x, then you, get the, you recover the exact same sort of growth rate. There's just a lot more geodesics, but they behave similar in a similar way up to a change of coordinates. Now the question about whether or not I meant primitive or not here, it turns out whether or not you take this to be primitive geodesics or not, the answer is still the same. Okay, so if I if I I could put primitive here, but it just turns that turns out that in this asymptotic, the primitive geodesics and the non-primitive the non-primitive geodesics are sort of ab exponentially small, so you can throw them away. Um, so I should attribute a lot of names to this. Uh, so this was first I think proved by Huber Selberg. And then it was generalized by Sarnak. And then eventually the biggest case was done by Margulis. OK, so this is, I don't know, the history goes through these three people. I think this it goes something like, um, uh, let's see, constant curvature, and then uh, all the way up to variable negative curvature, I think Margulis did this part. But I could, I could be a little wrong on that. Um, so yeah, this is, this is sort of the, the starting point of the analogy between these things is, is somehow the theorems that we can write down about the primes and the integer we can, or, or, or even more generally uh, uh, rings of integers of number fields, finite extensions of Q, we can write down similar theorems about uh, primes, or sorry, primitive geodesics. Okay, so this, this analogy actually continues. So not only do you have this sort of a theorem, there are also, and I don't want to write zeta functions on the board, but there's, there's also an analogy between the Riemann zeta function, the classical one for the, the Riemann hypothesis. And there's also some analogy between a Selberg zeta function. So here what this function looks like is it's some, is it's some power over all the primitive geodesics on your closed surface, and you're taking the exponential of some length of them. Okay, and one might guess that for similar theorems that we at least expect for the Riemann zeta function, we may expect for the Selberg zeta function. And even though I'm not going to write the function on the board, it turns out that, that this is actually true. So this thing has a, a meromorphic continuation, just like the classic zeta functions, and it has the analog of the Riemann hypothesis that it satisfies. Okay, so, so there are more theorems in this direction. And maybe one more theorem I'll say is uh, there's a classic theorem from number theory called the uh, the Chebotarov density theorem. So the Chebotarov density theorem says if I take a finite extension of Q and I look at the way the prime ideals split up in that finite extension, then actually they're distributed in a very, very particular way. So if you look over all the sets of primes and you want to know which ones split in, in certain ways, the Chebotarov density theorem tells you on the nose what that density is. And it turns out we have a similar theorem about uh, sort of geodesic flow um, for, for primitive uh, geodesics. So there's some sort of holonomy distribution theorem. Distribution theorem, theorem here. OK, and what I mean by this is, is if, you, if you take a closed geodesic, then it has a geodesic flow around it. And you can associate to this some kind of holonomy class. And it turns out that the way that you flow around these holonomies is exactly the same way that you, that you get the exact same asymptotic as you do in the Chebotarov density theorem. So as you let your geodesics go to infinity, which is sort of the analog of looking over all the primes in this theorem, uh, there, is, there is sort of an analogous exact same density. So, so the density here is you're looking at some orders of groups over the other ones. And here you're looking at some, some uh, some volumes of something over, over something else. So I, I don't know. It's, it's a little heavy, so I don't want to get too much into it. But I should put some names here. So, so this, is, this, this sort of here is done by Perry uh, Polycott. And then again, here this is, again, in, in increasing levels of generality. So this is by Sarnak Wakayama. And then uh, by, let's see, uh, Margulis. Then uh, Amir Mohammadi and he O. 
Okay, so this is increasing levels of generality. So these, they just did it for, for uh, SO, N1, I think, and then they did it for rank one lattices and they did it for thin groups afterwards. So whatever that may mean. Okay, but the whole point is there's this sort of, at least partial analogy between these two. I'm not saying there's a dictionary necessarily, but somehow there's a way to get between one and the other, and probably it, it functions through the trace formula, but it's, it's not so clear what the dictionary should be. But a good question, I think. So a question is sort of, what else can we say? Can we say about this analogy? So th by that I mean, are there any other sort of classical theorems about primes and the integers that we can translate over onto closed geodesics? Okay, so there's a really classical, well, not classical, there's, there's a celebrated uh, theorem called the green tau theorem. So this is how progression sort of relate to all these things. So a classical theorem by green and tau says that if I take the prime numbers, so uh, the set of prime numbers, has arbitrarily long, arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. So this arithmetic is different from the arithmetic I had before for a manifold, but let me, let's just recall what this means. So uh, a k-term arithmetic progression, term arithmetic, arithmetic progression, it's a sequence, so is a sequence of numbers, of natural numbers. Okay, that looks like sort of ai plus b. And here we're going to let i go from 1 to k. OK, so I don't know, like pick your favorite numbers, 3, 9, 15, so on. Hopefully I wrote something. Yeah, so here's a three-term progression. We'll just go with that. OK, and we say that, we say that a, a set has arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. So, so this, is, this is the same as k term for every k, k term for all k. Okay, so this is a, a rather, I think, shocking theorem when I first learned it. Because the prime numbers, uh, well, so there's a classical theorem in combinatorics called Semiretti's theorem. And Semiretti's theorem, it says if you have a positive density set, density set of the integer, or of the natural numbers, no matter what it is, it always contains arbitrary long arithmetic progressions. Okay, and this is what's supposed to have been a combinatorial masterpiece by his proof. But the prime numbers is definitely not a positive density, density set of the natural numbers. They're very, very, very rare. So the fact that they carry arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions, I think, is shocking. And this wasn't proved until, I think, 2006 or something, some recent time. This is a very sort of long thought about and celebrated theorem in uh, that. OK. So the question is, can we take this uh, theorem and can we recast it in the light of, of primitive geodesics? OK, so this is some recent work of LaFont and McReynolds. So here's the theorem, and this is sort of the main point we want to get to, is the theorem of LaFont and McReynolds. So here, this is in a very, very specific setting. So here we're going to let gamma be SL2Z, so we're looking at the modular curve. It's SL2Z. So here, well, I'll put the T there. Here G is the SL2R. Uh, then, M, which is going to be hyperbolic two space over gamma, is the modular curve. Curve. And L of M, or script L if you want, uh, sorry, LP of M. So remember, this P is going to mean all my primitive lengths of primitive geodesics. 
this has arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Really long arithmetic progressions. Moreover, so even better than this, so moreover, this chalk is really squeaky. Uh, moreover, uh, every primitive link shows up, shows up in arbitrarily long progressions. Okay, so the first thing they show is that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so the so what I mean here by an arbitrary long arithmetic progression is if you start with some length here, then you can find a sequence a i plus b, and here these are th this is going to be in the natural numbers, and then times the length such that that exists in the limit the primitive length spectrum. So, so the length itself may not be an integer, obviously, but. But this part will be, and that'll carry you through. Okay, and, and so, so they prove that not only can you find one of these things, but every primitive length shows up in an arbitrary long progression. So what that means is if you hand me a number sitting inside this, this primitive length spectrum or set, then they can always realize it in a k-term progression for any k they want. Okay, so this is sort of a very, very strong form of this. And the reason I think it's not too crazy to expect a, a more strong form is if you look at, well, now I only have one of the, the theorems on, but if you look at the prime geodesic theorem, then this was the exponential version of the prime number theorem. I had to make that change of variables to make the asymptotic look the same. So in some sense to me, I don't know, this is maybe a heuristic, but I call this the exponential version of the green tau. So somehow it's, it's not so shocking based on the growth rates of these things that every primitive length should show up. There's a lot of room. Yeah, there's a lot more room. Okay, and then another comment I'll make is, if you take this POA, then it's a stupid theorem. So you have to, you have to deal with primitive lengths here, because otherwise you take one geodesic and you just take powers of it and wind around it a bunch. So then it's a really, really stupid theorem. But actually you have to say something if you're doing the primitive geodesics. Okay, so another theorem and their work. So another theorem. And this, does, this doesn't require the modular curve, so this holds in general. So, oh, that's going to look like Miller. So maybe I should put Laplant McReynolds. Is that uh, having arbitrary long arithmetic progressions? Long. I'm going to shorten that to AP. AP uh, is a commensurability invariant. So namely, if I have any desk again, if I have any manifold that uh, shares a finite sheeted cover with the manifold uh, that did have arbitrary long arithmetic progressions, then that also has arbitrary long arithmetic progressions. And this isn't so bad. It's like a, a fairly cute uh, combinatorial argument based on some colorings of things. Uh, this isn't so geometric, but it, it's um, yeah. But this holds in general. This doesn't use the fact that they're on the, the modular curve. Okay, how much time? So, uh, so this is a, a fairly limited context. This is uh, this lattice is one commensurability class, but it turns out that that the the uh, it's it's more generally true. So, one can actually say this in a more general context. You can actually uh, do it for two closed two and three hyperbolic manifolds. So, so if M is a closed arithmetic arithmetic hyperbolic. Call it two or three manifold. Then the same thing holds. So LP M has arbitrarily long, long arithmetic progressions. Oops. And moreover, over every primitive link shows up. Okay. 
So this is a lot more commensurability classes than, than this. Uh, okay, so maybe uh, before, so what I'm gonna do in a second is I'm gonna sketch their work because it's a lot sort of easier before, before getting into co-compact lattices and then maybe I'll, I'll give a flavor of what the difference is. But uh, maybe I'll take a pause to say something about spectral geometry here. Um, so if you take a, a random negatively, or if you take a, a random closed smooth manifold and you look at the space of all negatively curved metrics on it, then actually it's a result of this paper as well that uh, almost none of the metrics, or, or having arbitrary long arithmetic progressions is very rare. So more specifically what I mean by that is they prove that in the space of, of negatively curved metrics that having even a three term progression uh, off of a, or, or there's a, there's a, sorry, there's a, a dense G delta set in that space that none of them have even a three term progression. So in the entire space of these metrics, it's very rare to even have one progression, let alone have arbitrarily long progressions. Um, and there's some whole sort of dictionary between these things and, and the way that the metrics should behave. Um, and maybe I'll say more. So a, a conjecture of also their paper is that the ones that do have these arbitrarily long progressions and have this stronger property that every primitive length shows up are very, very special in the sense that they think that these are, are only the locally symmetric metrics. And so it, it's an open question actually for higher rank lattices uh, if the primitive le length spectrum determines that you're a locally uh, symmetric metric. And they conjecture that having this strong AP property uh, is equivalent to being basically arithmetic. Um, so so th this has sort of a spectral story and, and that sounds really hard to me but one, one sort of maybe thinks that this could help with some local rigidity at least there. What's my theorem? That one, over there. Sorry, this is yours? Yeah, th sorry, this is me. Oh, because yeah. you said that you were going to try to sort of Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> ah, very good. Yeah. Okay. So let me briefly sketch their result and then sh sort of say something about the difficulties in the co-compact case. Okay, so, so their result at least, so if gamma now is, is SL2Z, then what, and say gamma is some hyperbolic element, what they wanna do to sort of prove this result is they, is they would take a hyperbolic element and they're gonna kick it around. And they wanna kick it around the, the length spectrum in such a way that they can exactly control the power as to which it falls back in. And if they can control the powers to which it falls back in, then they can start to produce these progressions because if I take it to the nth power, then that'll just be n times the length so long as I can keep it primitive. So the nice thing about these, these sort of quintessentially arithmetic things is they have some nice symmetries. So what they first do is they take some hyperbolic element and so they conjugate it by an element of the co commensurator. So this is maybe step one, is they conjugate by some very specific matrix, so it's just one P. So this is some A to P. And if you had some matrix before, so, so gamma, if gamma is A, B, C, D, then once after you conjugate it by this matrix, it looks really nice. So this is just A, B, uh, P inverse, P, C, D, so something like that. Okay, and then what they're gonna do is is since this is in the commensurator, you know that some power, if you take some power of this element, it has to fall back into the lattice at some point. Okay, so let, so, so uh, uh, the arithmeticity condition, well, the fact that that's in the commensurator, so, so we know that there exists some J such that this falls back into the lattice. So J is in the gamma. Okay, and they want to just find the right ones. Okay, so, so uh, let sort of n of gamma be the minimal such. Okay. So the first step is just to, to analyze what this number can be. Okay, so what do they do? Well, and maybe I should make this n of gamma and a to p. 
Okay, so what they're going to do is they're going to start with this, and then they're going to keep kicking it around. And what, you're, what they see is, so step two, is again you twist by the same element, and you show that when I twist by an extra power, so this is n of, of gamma and then say eta p to the i, and if I, this is the same as uh, p times n gamma eta i minus 1 p. So what they do is, is if I take the ith power of this element and then I take enough powers that it falls back into the lattice, then it's the same thing as taking i minus, uh, I minus 1 powers of eta and then twisting by that, and then taking uh, p times that number of powers. Okay, so how does one prove this? Well, this condition here, if I take, if I take say, i powers of eta and I twist by that, then I'll just get p to the minus i here and p to the i there. Okay, so what you're doing is, is you're coming up with some sort of divisibility condition on this coefficient for it to fall back in the lattice. So if I twist by those elements, then I know that this element falls back in if and only if, if I take gamma to the high enough power that that coefficient is divisible by p to the i. Okay, so it's just sort of some clever thing. And then the way that this p pops out is just some reduction mod p trick. Okay. Okay, so that's their, that's their step two. So, so what this implies is that they have uh, a very specific thing in the primitive length spectrum. So they started with some length l, and what they've constructed is p to the l, p squared, l, and so on inside here. Primitive length m. Okay. And then step three is to, to patch. So this is very far from being an arithmetic progression. I'm multiplying by p every time. I'm not adding the same number over and over again. Okay, but then step three is just to glue these things together. So glue these together, together for each p. Okay, so what I mean by this is the way you prove a formula like this is with reduction mod p. But then it, for, to to get to sort of get back from these things, you'll have to reduce mod n, and you use some Chinese remainder theorem type argument here. But this is sort of the backbone of um, this. So, so these, these aren't genuine arithmetic progressions in the primitive length spectrum. I'm multiplying by p every time. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to somehow, I have, but I do have these for every p. So somehow I need to stick them all together at once. And the way that one does this is, is a similar way to proving, to proving what they did here. So they use some sort of Chinese remainder theorem to say that you can do this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A and again, I'm not saying everything because you still need to know that these things are primitive once you twist. And uh, they actually, they, they do something, they have some sort of stronger than hyperbolic condition here that they use. It's called absolutely primitive, but uh, maybe that's for afterwards if someone really wants the details. Okay. So this is sort of the, the idea though of how one might prove something like this. You start with an element and then you twist it and you want to know the minimal power it falls back in the lattice because this is what you're going to use to, to, um, to create your progression. So, and then you need to be able to control that in some certain way by twisting by some very specific elements to do that. Okay, so maybe, let's see. Yeah, so, so maybe, I'll, maybe I'll say a word about the difficulty. And here, maybe I'll restrict myself quickly to SL2R. OK, so let me just briefly outline what a co-compact lattice looks like in SL2R. So you can say you saw one in this talk. Uh, and then uh, maybe I'll leave it at the fact that these, it's not as nice as SL2Z. SL2Z, you can conjugate by this very specific element, and it comes out in a very specific way. OK, so a co-compact lattice in SL2Z, these are, are built on what's called the quaternions. Okay, so by this, I mean, so, uh, so these are uh, a four-dimensional vector space. Over 
over Q. So in this case, I'm just going to look over Q. OK, so the basis is going to be fairly simple, just one i, j, and some other element i, j. And they just have specific multiplication rules. So then you give it a multiplication. So it's i squared. So it's an algebra. So it's i squared equals a, j squared equals b, and ij equals minus ij, or sorry, ji. OK, and this is just for some a, b, and q star. OK, so every, every co-compact lattice in SL2R is just going to look like the z points of one of these things. So this gives, it, gives you an, an algebra. So this gives a quaternion algebra. Quaternion algebra. We'll call it A. And this thing also has a norm, so you can take the norm one elements. So this and has norm one elements. Elements. Uh, we'll call it A1. Okay, so all, all the co-compact lattices in SL2R, this is a classification of the arithmetic co-compact lattices. So this is arithmetic. So all uh, co-compact lattices arithmetic lattices in SL2R. And this is up to commensurability. They look like A1, Z. So here by Z, I mean I'm just taking integer coefficients instead of Q coefficients now. So the nice thing about SL2Z is that it looks like SL2Z. If you're thinking about a co-compact lattice in SL2R, the difficulty really is that they're sort of messy. It's, I'm taking some quaternion algebra. I'm taking the Z points. It's not clear what to do. Now these things, they have matrix realizations. You can embed them into matrices. But when you do that, they look really, really symmetric. And so that's also a problem. Is SL2Z, there's a lot of leeway. There, it's, it's not, not every matrix you, pick, matrix you pick in in uh, SL2Z is very symmetric. But all these things are really, really symmetric. And moreover, if you want sort of their, to deal with their commensurators, that's also a little more symmetric. So uh, the difficulty is how do you sort of play these three steps? So here there's a very specific element. It does very specific things to each of the entries. And so you can very specifically pull these coefficients out. And so the question is, how do I make these things sort of look like this procedure? And uh, maybe there's not much time, but uh, I'll maybe end here by saying, locally, though, these things do look very similar. So one can play a, a similar trick. But uh, maybe I should end there before going too much over. <laughs>